So this is the latest Liam Neeson actioner. As I said, you know, I, I, I had, had come up with uh, taking the drama. You wrote Snorri Express. So he's a, the titular ex-cop. He's now a um, uh, life insurance salesman. There's quite a nippy opening sequence in which we see the drudge of his daily life, getting the train, going to work, walking through... Uh, Grand Central Station, while the seasons change around him, while his family change around him. That's actually rather well done. And at first, it kind of has a little bit of that that downbeat air that the girl on the train had. You know, the thing about we're doing this, but it's all a bit pointless. And it's, I mean, very, very early on, he's got mounting bills, but, you know, to pay for his kids' tuition, and then he loses his job. He can't tell his wife, he can't face his life. He's a commuter with no job to go to. It's all looking terribly bad until... On the commuter train, what he gets every day, he is stopped, collared and cornered by Vera Farmiga, who says to him, I'd like you to track down a mysterious traveller for me. Why would I do it? Because there would be a reward. Uh Uh-huh. So, uh, what's the reward? In the bathroom, carriage two. Maybe there is a package. It's hidden. And inside that package is $25,000. That money is yours, plus another 75 cash. If you do this one little thing. I don't understand. Someone on this train does not belong. All you have to do is find them. That's it. This person is carrying a bag. You don't know what it looks like, but inside that bag is something they have stolen. This person goes by the name of Prin. It's not a real name. They will be on this train until cold spring. You find them, you find the bag, that $100,000 is yours. (laughs) That's the setup then. Yes, that is the most basil that is possible for an exposition to be. Um, here's the thing. There is this, uh, you know, people keep, whenever you have a thriller like this, people always refer to it as a Hitchcockian, a you know, Hitchcockian thriller. Um, it's on a train, it's got a setup, it's got a thing. There is a very basic thing about the uh, the first rule of the Hitchcockian thriller is not that you don't talk about the Hitchcockian thriller. The first rule of the Hitchcockian thriller is that the thriller follows the rules that it sets and those rules make sense okay so if you're going to have that whole thing about you know here's the setup and it's it's what then later on became i suppose referred to as the high concept setup you know there it is there's the thing you're on a train there's somebody they don't mean they can't tell you who it is they've got a bag doesn't know what it looks like but you've got from here until there to do and if you do it you're going to get this money if you don't okay so there's the so the so what happens in the case of the commuter is you have that setup. In, even during the setup, I'm thinking, pardon? Okay, fine, I'll go with it. Yeah, okay, so he's on a train, he's got to find somebody, a thing, and he knows they get off at a certain stop. So the first thing he's got to do is he's got to figure out which passengers are going to that certain stop. And this is the thing. And he's why is he going to do it? Because there's money in it, and he needs money, okay? He needs money. So is he basically, the moral quandary is, he doesn't know what's going to happen to the person when he finds them, but he, he needs money, and he's just lost his job, and if he does the thing, then he's going to get the money, but maybe something bad will happen to them. Who knows? Vera Farmiga seems very, very suspicious. Go, oh, that's a setup. And then about 20 minutes in, the film goes... I'm actually I'm not very interested in that. So it throws out the setup. It throws out the reason that he's doing. It brings in an old reason that we've seen before in Taken 1, Taken 2, Taken 3, and, you know, Taken the Mickey. And it just gets down to Liam Neeson, commuter puncher. And it's the most frustrating thing about this film, quite apart from the fact that Liam Neeson does really look like he's sort of fed up with all of this stuff. And there was a, an interview with him at a film festival in which he said, Look, I, you know, I think I'm going to stop doing action movies because I'm, you know, whatever age I'm. But the fact is, he's a very charismatic action star. Well, you and I were having a conversation just recently. I was saying, it, isn't it strange that somebody who had actually built their entire reputation on sort of thoughtful thespianness then developed this whole other area in which they were, you know, they were action stars? Because when we were talking about Liam Neeson Wolf Puncher, mm-hmm. Um, but in the case of this, he just... So you'd think he'd do it the other way around. He'd be like an action figure yeah, when he then, was 25. Who then became serious. And in his case, it happened completely the other way around. But 
the the problem with this is directed by John Collett Serra, who with whom he's worked, you know, three times before, and essentially made the same film uh, three times before. Um, and it's you know it, the, the whole big thing is here's the setup, here's the thing, here's the rules, here's the, and then literally twenty minutes, twenty five minutes in, the film goes, I can't be I can't be bothered with that. It doesn't make any sense. It did you know it, we never had much faith in it anyway. It was just a thing because it looked quite good in the trailer. Can we just have him running around punching people again? And that's exactly where it goes to and if you've seen the trailer which i unfortunately had there are sections in the trailer that are from the very very end of the film so uh, it's like do you ever see the trailer for speed i remember the movie whether speed. i saw the trailer or not I as no uh, eddie has said which in france should be called la vitesse but in fact it was called speed um the trailer for speed was very I good because it has to be eddie is hard to get away with that by the way unnecessarily withering but there we are Carry the on. trailer for speed was really brilliant because it gave you you know you knew the setup and it gave you the setup but it didn't spoil the film in the case of this it gives you the setup but then it realizes that the setup actually doesn't really last very long in the film so it just gets down to spoiling the film with smashy crashy action bits that tell you exactly how all this is going to play out anyway so it's dunderheaded it sets up rules that don't make any sense that it then breaks it appears to have been put together on the basis of, well, we did that one before when he had to run around the, with the thing with the plane, and we did the thing before when he had to run around the, and he's good in the tape. Can you just do a bit of that and a bit of that and a bit of that, then put them all together? Where do you want it to be? Train. Yeah, fine. We've done train planes and automobiles. That's it. Thank you very much. Boom, boom. It's absolutely murder on the Snorrient Express. <laughs> 